Hello, and this is Herosia Soft Bubble. This is Herosia Scheib um, once again, here with the uh, Herosia Thought Bubble, in which I'm going to discuss them and, and go in depth on um, my musings of what's happening um, in the day. In particular, on this episode, um, I'm going to talk about two uh, distinctly different uh, news incidents and then go into my review on um, Mastodon. Uh, this is episode three. Um, I think I'm going to name it Snuffleupagus is my best friend. So this is from the Daily Beast. Uh, good lawyers are killing the death penalty. Attorneys saved four lives last week during the Arkansas execution mania. By driving up the cost of killing, they will save many more across the country. This is by Andrew Novick. Um, last Thursday, Arkansas executed Liddell Lee for murder, the first execution in the state since 2005. It's also the first of eight scheduled executions the state originally planned to carry out before its supply of its lethal injection drug expired on April 30th. The biggest news, however, is that Arkansas carried out one execution, but the lawyers managed to stop four others. Last Monday, the Supreme Court of Arkansas stayed the executions of Bruce Ward and Don Davis for independent me- mental health el- evaluations. On Thursday, Stacey Johnson won a stay to allow additional testing for potential DNA evidence, and separately, Jason McGee's execution schedule for April 27th was received following a recommendation for clemency by the Arkansas Parole Board. Undoubtedly, Lee's crime was serious. He was a serial rapist who murdered 26-year-old Deborah Reese in her home with a tire pressure gauge. However, about 130 murderers are committed in the state each year. Arkansas has a death row population of 32. Did Lee's crimes really represent the worst of the worst? There's not, there's this, there's, this is to say nothing of Lee's claim of innocence supported by as yet untested DNA evidence and his claims that his post-conviction lawyer was intoxicated. The execution in Arkansas has shown that the death penalty is lawless. Officials with complete discretion over the process claim they are bound by the law and have no choice in the matter. In every case across the country, chance and geography, not the seriousness of the crime, determines who lives and dies. The expiration date of the state's supply of medalsalum dictated the outcome in these case. When the U.S. Supreme Court denied the prisoner's appeal on Thursday night, uh, Justice Stephen Breyer dissented, calling the decision to execute before the drugs used by day close to random. The prisoners who were not executed last week benefited from the, from the same game of chance. The lesson is that the death penalty defense lawyers have become better at playing the odds. Every lawsuit or appeal filed, every new psychiatric, psychiatric evaluation or DNA test order has a consequence of driving up the structural cost of execution. Every delay makes it less likely that the execution will be carried out at all. The slow attrition of the death penalty has reached a tipping point. Today, prosecutors rarely seek the death penalty in the first place. Only 30 new death penalty sentences were passed in 2016. One-tenth of the number passed in 1998. The Supreme Court continues to chip away at the death, pe- pe- death penalty, most recently invalidating state laws that allowed a judge to impose a death sentence over the objection of a jury. Importers of the legal, lethal injection drugs are halted at the border, with no refund for state taxpayers who footed the, footed the bill. Even clemency may be more promising than it used to be. Last, last week, Virginia Governor Terry uh, McLaughlin commuted the death sentence of Ivan Tugoski amid surprisingly little controversy, and Arkansas's overreach gave him cover. The reason for the success? Lawyers, lawyers, intervene in capital cases sooner than ever and, and stay in the case longer. They appeal more frequently, file more pleadings, and cultivate new challenges. They do not always win, but they the com- the com- the cumulative effort of constructing more barriers to an execution, an extra clemency petition, or one more Hail, Hail Mary stay request renders the entire machine of death unsustainable in the long term. Conservative com- commentator Joanne Goldberg defended the Arkansas executions, alleging that the anti-death penalty advocates were disingenuous in driving up the cost of execution and then complaining about the death penalty's expense. The strategy may be cynical, but it's successful. The death penalty has become so rare that it's handicapped by its own arbitrariness and as law has always been cruel and is now unusual. The most unprecedented aspect of the Arkansas execution is the direct devolvement of drug companies. McKenzie, the distributor of the paralytic agent, sued Arkansas directly in the manufacturers of all three drugs in the lethal injection cocktail 
field briefs in both the prisoner's claims and the McKinsey lawsuit. McKinsey claims that the drugs were obtained by deceit. The first two drugs in the Arkansas Lethal Injection Protocol are nationwide shortage with hospitals on a waiting list. At present, there are no more FDA-approved suppliers left in the United States that are willing to sell the drugs to correction facilities. So I'm going to kind of stop here. One of the biggest things uh, for those who have advocated against the death penalty, um, one of the triumphs really is going after the manufacturers of the lethal injections. In particular, finding out you know who, make, who makes the drugs, how it's manufactured, who's supplying them, who makes the decisions to do so. And then a lot of uh, advocates started going and petitioning these drug companies and getting them to either stop altogether or um, finding out if they're actually even properly licensed to issue these drugs or if it's used in the manner that the FDA approved. In some instances, it was not the case. Um, because of the, the political attachment of manufacturing a drug for the death penalty, um, people either pulled their stocks or considered pulling their funding. Um, all sorts of things ha- began to happen. And because of that, it made it very, very um, difficult to execute people by lethal injection. In fact, it's, be- it's becoming where it's not even an option. And the options left available are um, hanging someone, shooting someone, and possibly electric or gas. But considering that gas and an electric are something that many states have pulled away from, you're left with hanging and, and and shooting someone, which many states don't even have that on their books as a means of uh, lethal execution. So those who have advocated against, you know, the death penalty altogether have made significant successes. Uh, the, the second biggest success, I think, is the fact that with DNA testing now and the fact that the science of it is um, has demonstrated to be pretty much irrefutable, and more and more of these tests are being done, being conducted. People are getting released. It's cheaper to do. It's not really that expensive. And it's not, it doesn't take um, that very long to conduct a very thorough DNA test. That um, many, many of uh, these death penalty cases are being overturned. Life sentences are in fact being overturned. And no one wants to be the governor or the prosecutor responsible for or even the judge for uh, issuing a death penalty to a person that may in fact not have committed the crime um so this whole plan of chipping away in fact i think will make for the most part the death penalty um very moot as you can see um some of these these cases for advocating the death penalty have dropped you have, it has to be something like, I guess you can say, the most egregious of the egregious for anyone to even seek the death penalty now. Um, if drug companies continue to directly inter- intervene in death penalty cases, lethal injection will become even more difficult to carry out. The Arkansas Attorney General is outgunned, and McKinsey is represented by Covington and Burling, the largest and most prestigious, prestigious, prestigious law firm in Washington, D.C., and supported by strong local councils. Stakes seeking to carry out executions face more formal opponents than ever before. Uh, more clashes are certain. Arkansas plans to execute three, three more inmates this week. Jack Jones and Marcel Williams are scheduled for execution on Monday night, and Kenneth Williams is scheduled for Thursday. Although a state and federal trial court denied stay requests based on the defendant's health claims this weekend, a wave of challenges remain pending and will continue until the time the execution begins. A novel challenge pending in federal court is to the Arkansas execution protocol, which is unclear as to whether the curtains in the viewing room must be open when the inmates enter the execution chamber or when the drugs are first administrated. And delay, no matter how trivial, is a small victory. Uh, the prisoners' executions are scheduled to begin 7 p.m. each night, and the death warrants expire at midnight. If the clock runs out on the death warrants, Arkansas will not be able to reschedule the execution before the Mazazel supply expires at the end of the month. And the reality is stark. If the executions are not carried out this week, they likely never will be. The truth is that the death penalty will die because it's simply not worth the effort. The structural cost of execution, which far exceeded those of, of life without parole, itself a very costly sentence, outweigh any social benefits to victims or, or the broader community. The sheer randomness of executions undermines any marginal uh, deference value of the death penalty over life imprisonment. And this is not the evidence that our criminal justice system is broken. To the contrary, the sensitivity to its cost is economically rational. 
In short, our system works exactly as it's supposed to, and we can thank lawyers for that. So I think overall the, the chipping of the costs will uh, end the practice of the death penalty um, in the United States. It's extremely expensive. You can't just, you know, even those who uh, support the death penalty, you can't just go and take somebody out in the back and shoot in the back of the head. It's just it's not possible. And it's not how um, our system, our court system is designed or even meant to do. And I think you will see more and more life sentences without parole. But even life sentences without parole are starting to be questioned, particularly when it comes to, uh, in particular, when it comes to uh, mandatory uh, sentencing in general. And some other bit of news. Um, I guess they kind of tie together just by the sheer fact of humanness and the way people behave. So robots are racist and sexist, just like the people who created them by Laura Penny. Um, this is from The Guardian. Uh, this overall speaks to a fundamental problem within the tech industry. The fact that they, they have failed to deal with um, the social interactions that are in everyday human lives, like the, the negative, if you will. Um, you know, like harassment on the various social media apps, uh, the fact that the, they don't have any, for the longest time, very difficult for them to do filter systems or taking down certain types of posts or when things get reported or how they're getting reported. And there's not um, any consistent mechanism or the fact there wasn't even any mechanism in the first place when these were, these um, social media apps were designed. And a lot of defense was, well, the creators of it, if you will, even if they actually even use the platform. Like, for example, a lot of the people that um, started Twitter and supported Twitter, um, you know, on the inside, a lot of them didn't actually even use the app in itself. And then, and, and, and those that did, not to the degree that their, their users did. And they were like, well, I don't get harassed or I don't see any of that in my feed. As if, if because an action doesn't occur to them means that the action doesn't exist or it doesn't occur at all. And um, it's not surprising that uh, these uh, chat bots or machines or anything like that are reflective of not only the, the creators, but society in general of being, you know, uh, can machines think? And if so, can they think critically about race and gender? Recent reports have shown that machine learning systems are picking up racist and sexist ideas embedded in the language patterns that they're fed by human engineers. The idea that machines can be as bigoted as people is uncomfortable, and one of the one of anyone who still believes in moral purity of digital future, that there's nothing new or complicated about it. Machine learning is a fancy way of saying finding patterns in data. And of course, as Lydia Nicholas, senior researcher at the uh, Innovation think tank Nesta explains, all this data has to have been collected in the past and since society changes, you can end up with patterns that reflect the past. And if those patterns are used to make decisions that affect people's lives, you end up with unacceptable discrimination. Robots have been racist and sexist for as long as people created them. Having been racist and sexist because machines work only from the information given to them, usually by white straight men who dominate the fields of technology and robotics. As long as in 1986, the medical school at St. George's Hospital in London was found guilty of racial and sexual discrimination when it automated its admission process based on data collected in the 1970s. The program looked at the sort of candidates who have been successful in the past and gave similar people interviews. Unsurprisingly, the, the people the computer considered suitable were male and had names that looked Anglo-Saxon. Automation is a great excuse for assholery. After all, it's just numbers, and the magic of big data can provide possible deniability for prejudice. Machine learning, as the technologist Marcy Sojolski observed, can function in this way as money laundering for bias. And yeah, and this is an increasing problem with when it comes to programs that are, in, that are being utilized for um, police departments because the input in the data is false. Uh, for one, the data is never collected accurately to begin with. Two, there was an over sampling of certain segments within society in general. And disproportionately, the other segments of society were either underreported or not reported at all. So it's not reflected in the overall, you know, 
either crime or actions or the probability of someone committing a certain type of a crime, if you will. We're moving to an era when smart machines will have more and more influences on our lives, and the moral economy of machines is not subject to oversight in the way that human bureaucrats are. Last year, Microsoft created the chatbot, Tay, which can learn and develop and engage with users on social media. Within hours, it had pledged allegiance to Hitler and had started repeating alt-right slogans, which had which is what happens when you give Twitter a baby to raise. Less intentional but equally awkward instances of robotic intolerance keep cropping up, as when one Google image search using technology trained to recognize faces based on images of Caucasians included African-American people among its search results for gorillas. Yeah, I saw that. And if you just do Google search of just um, black people or just any type of marginalized people, you're, you're not going to find the, the first picture results to be... Um, very positive at all. These, however, are the only most egregious examples. Others, ones we might not notice on a daily basis, are less likely to be spotted and fixed. As more of the decisions affecting our daily lives are handed out to automatons, subtler and more insidious shifts in the way we experience technology, from our dealings with banks and businesses to our online social lives, will continue to be based on the baked in bigotries of the past unless we take steps to change the trend. Should we? Tr- be trying to build robots with the capacity for moral judgment? Should technologists be constructing AIs that can implement basic assessments about justice and fairness? I have a horrible feeling that I've seen that in a movie and it doesn't end well for human beings. There are features, however, and one of them is a society where we allow the weary bigotries of the past to become written into the source code of the present. Machine learning language by gobbling up and digesting huge bodies of all the available writing that exists online. What this means is that the voices that dominated in the world of literature and publishing for centuries, the voices of white Western men, are fossilized into the language patterns of the instruments influence our world today, along with the assumption that meant that those men had about people who were different from them. That doesn't mean robots are racist. It means people are racist and we're raising robots to reflect our own prejudice. In particular, when gobbling up a language, if um, it's considering the English language is the most dominant language um globally in the world for business transaction and online it means that you're just going to get a western perspective uh even if um and most of these robots are not um multilinguist if you will so you're not going to get you know um the writings and teachings of from china or india or russia or um uh kenya or nigeria or anything like that you're going to get english-based languages and so even in these other societies where they might be still male dominant you're, you're still getting a, a white western gaze if you will and not uh the whole global perspective on everything and even all those other places have their own different forms of bigotry and um discrimination and ills in themselves that could even if there was a a robot or the data information where multilinguists could reinforce uh, certain um, um, viewpoints, if you will, because, you know, people are horrible. Um, just think of um, the viewpoints that would be towards, you know, um, of the LGBTQ uh, community, LGBTQT community. Yeah. Human beings, after all, learn our own prejudice in a very similar way. We grow up understanding the world through the language and stories of previous generations. We learn that men can mean all human beings, but women never does. And so we learn that that to be female is to be other, to be a subclass of person, not by not the default. We learn that when our leaders and parents talk about how a person behaves to their own people, they sometimes mean people of the same race. And so we come to understand people of different skin tones to us are not part of that we. Uh, we are given one of two pronouns in English, he or she. And so we learn that gender is a person defining characteristics and that there are no more than two. This is why those of us who are concerned with fairness and social justice often work at the level of the language, and when people react to having their prejudices confronted, they often complain about language policing, if the, if the use of words can ever be separated from the words they create. A language itself is a pattern for predicting human experience. It's just, it does not just describe our world, it shapes it too. The encoded bigotries of machine learning sometimes gives us an opportunity to, sa- to see how this works in practice, but human beings, unlike machines, have moral f- faculties and we can rewrite our own patterns of prejudice and privilege and we should sometimes we fail to see what be fair and just and we would like to be not because we set out to be biggest and bullies but because we are working from assumptions we have internalized about race gender and social difference we learn patterns of behavior based on bad outdated information that doesn't make us bad people or nor does it excuse us from responsibility for our behavior 
Algorithms are expected to update their response based on new and better information, and the moral failing occurs when people refuse to do the same. If robots can do it, so can we. So I think in general, what it what would have to be done is there would have to be a more comprehensive um, understanding of data, what is missing, what is not there, uh, how it was inputted, how it was collected, and filter that out bef- and um, either recollect the data in and of itself or do some adjustments to it in order to better improve um, these AIs or this robot learning because they're not going anywhere. And if we continue to feed them bad data, then they're, we're going to continue getting bad results and there's not going to be any significant progress or resolve for these machines, but they could be a double down of certain prejudices or certain biases that are um, inherent within the human condition. So those are my thoughts on these two news stories. Uh, they're very interesting. It'd be interesting to see what um, what progress is made with these AIs and machines. Um, and as far as the death penalty, it's still going to be here in the States. Uh, I don't think it's going to be going anywhere. I just think the manner of death may in fact change and will just become less and less of a frequent thing, more so than now. Eventually, maybe perhaps by the end of the decade or the end of the next maybe the death penalty in itself in the united states will cease to be in existence so now on to my review of the new social media craze mastodon mastodon is the latest uh, social media app or site if you will that has gained some popularity it came into existence in september 2016 i found about Mastodon and I think it was either technology or uh, decentralized um, subreddit which uh, spoke about Mastodon and what it is is a Twitter-like clone that seeks to not have a centralized company that can control it. Uh, It also seeks to be a more um, safe space away from commercialization as well as harassment. There is um, baked in, built in privacy filters where you can control who can see and who can even at you or follow you within um the mastodon system so like if for example if they don't even know your username they might not be even to find your exists built on these series of server protocol instances and we'll we'll break it all down but basically what it seeks to do is that twitter has asmet particularly and the usability or the feasibility of Twitter, um, the way that people tweet, if you will, the way that people respond to one another um, is a much cleaner, if you will, look. It kind of looks like the um, media app of, of TweetDeck where you have like these columns, these the UI columns where you have your, your timeline, uh, what is called the federated timeline, which is um, everybody's who's tweeting within your space or your instance, if you will. Um, and then the middle column is the, the people that um, you are particularly following. So you can, everything's kind of broken down in a clean fashion. Um, you know, you have an avatar, you have a username, which is a little bit different than what Twitter is. Uh, but basically, the, the sole purpose, if you will, is it's an open source social media server. So anyone can, or microblogging, so anyone can um, clone it, break off from it, create their own um, platform altogether and call it something else, um, and create their own instance. And it's open in that sense. So there's no centralized system. There's no single company that owns it. And it would be, I would think, very difficult, particularly when um, an issue that's been plaguing Twitter for years or just social media in general is when um, newspaper articles um, write about people's like tweets or take their tweets and embed them within their articles and oftentimes without permission of the person who makes a tweet or builds off or takes their concept and and makes something different. Um, For example, on Twitter, which actually started in Tumblr, uh, there was this picture that was tweeted out that had um, Rihanna, the pop star, in um, oh god, Lupina Nyato. I hope I said her name right. Uh, she was in Twelve Years a Slave. She's in Black Panther. 
Um, she was in Queen of Karate. She's a very popular um, um, actress, up and coming actress. And she was also in Star Wars: uh, The Force Awakens as uh, Maz, the uh, CGI uh, Yoda-like character. And um, they were just together. And then someone, um, on, I guess, it started on Tumblr. And I will try to look for who how it started, but I'll just go into the story and then I'll kind of tag in the end who started it. But basically what it was, was uh, the person said that this picture looks like uh, Rihanna is um, someone who schemes and scams um, rich people and Lupiana is um, her smart, savvy computer friend that makes the scams happen. And then someone says this movie needs to happen and then it kind of exploded out to the point to where both Rihanna and um, Lupita, you know, Lupita added Rihanna and says, yeah, let's make this happen, in kind of in a joking way. And then Rihanna responded back, like, yeah, she was down for it. And now, supposedly, in newspaper articles, there's actually somebody sitting down at a writing desk trying to make this movie happen, where uh, Rihanna is a scam artist who scams rich millionaires, and Lupita Inatu is... Uh, her computer scientist best friend making it all happen so just weird things like that that happen in social media and twitter but people are not getting you know accredited and stuff like that or when it comes to social issues where people are embedded in news articles and then get um, harassed because either the nature of the article in itself or the added attention that they didn't really um, want to seek is displayed for them or the fact that because these ads uh, these new newspaper, newspaper articles are have embedded um, ads and their their tweet might have been an inspiration for this news article if you will and their tweet actually embedded in the news article they're not you know they're, they're not getting compensation for it there's so there's a lot of issues of you know harassment on Twitter is very pervasive um, all different kinds of forums it gets very difficult to navigate the space if you're particularly very popular there's a lot of um, actors and actresses and popular people um, that have left Twitter or left certain social media sites because they can't um, engage with their fans without getting trolled if you will uh, Twitter in itself doesn't block people as well uh, you can have as many different types of accounts as you will if you want even when they get reported, these trolls then just go around and create a new account. So there's no IP address uh, blocking. There's no linking of phone numbers, none of that stuff, or emails, or any type of um, harassment protocol, if you will, on behalf of Twitter to stop that. And as a result of that, you know, Twitter has not been very successful in not only making ad revenue buys, but being bought by bigger companies. I mean, it was in discussion being bought by Disney. It was in discussion being bought, I think, even by Verizon. Uh, a lot of different companies have made buy, uh, attempts to buy Twitter, but because of the harassment issue, because of the troll issue, because they allow for the creation of bots that are not um, really policed by them, so you have no real idea who, how many people are actually on Twitter that are real. Um, the types of, you know, people, the tweets that go back and forth, what tweets are actually real, which are manufactured. These kind of things made it very difficult to, for an advertiser to actually see any value in the usage of Twitter. And as a result, you know, they've gone down in valuation over the years because of these ongoing issues that they have not um, resolved but it's still a very powerful force if you want to get notice if you want to make a statement if you want to promote something twitter is one of the better social media apps out there it is like the old school village herald that would go into you know the, the common ground and shout out the day's news or shout out what's going on if you will the uh young boy you see in the, the movies or the pictures the newspaper boy that had the newspaper thing shouting out what the news the news title of the day is to sell his the paper and 
because of it, it's still very powerful, but it's becoming more of a legacy system and it's kind of becoming a bit stagnant. And the efforts on behalf of Twitter to try to retain its uh, user base but also grow has not been very successful and has left and has left for uh, other social media apps to kind of take a space. You know, Snapchat um, has accelerated in usage. Instagram is still very huge. Um, it's becoming, actually, Instagram is becoming more of what Twitter used to be as far as uh, promoting oneself and getting one's um, news out there or heralding, if you will. Um, Facebook uh, is still with this messaging app is still a place to go uh, for people. So, but Mastodon, you know, seeks to be a little bit different than that. It seeks for people to be able to socially engage and interact without the commercialization, without the abuse, and be able to set up their systems in such a way to where it's minimized to the point either to non-existence or just to not the, to the extent that other social media um, apps have the issue or problem. So we'll do, go a little bit about the history and everything about Mastodon here. So uh, this is from the Daily Dot, pretty much soon right after Mastodon came into existence. And it's just kind of a breakdown of it. Uh, it's by Christina uh, Boynton, and it came out November 22nd of 2016. So Mastodon is an open source, decentralized version of Twitter. So you want to share your thoughts on social media, but you're tired of the ways apps like Facebook and Twitter monopolize your posts and feeds. It might be time to try an entirely new alternative, Mastodon. Mastodon builds itself as a free open source social media server, like Twitter, is a microblogging platform. Unlike Twitter, it's non-commercial and not centrally owned. So you don't have to worry about what will happen to your account or your post if it gets acquired by another company. Uh, Mastodon has a, this is a big issue, particularly like for things like Tumblr with through this days where people utilize Tumblr and then it got sold. And then even Instagram where if you post on Instagram, you actually don't even own your own pictures. So things like this are very important. Uh, Mastodon has a similar look and feel to TweetDeck, employing a column based UI for your timeline mentions and its composed fields. You can share thoughts on articles, links via text, and you can attach media to your posts. Unfortunately, like any new social network, it suffers from the chicken and the egg problem of getting new users on board. To speed things up, you can add your Twitter followers to Mastodon using this tool here, and if you prefer, you can also run the app as a closed instance, keeping it private to a specific group of friends or coworkers. If you're looking for social media experience um, that's not backed by Peter Thiel or favored by our president-elect, Trying Mastodon could be worth a shot. So that's just very early on. Um, when I first went on to Mastodon, um, the, the main instance is called Mastodon uh, Social. And I have a link in the show notes to two of my Mastodon um, usernames. And what instances are, are just basically independent servers that people have Put together. In the case of the individual who created Mastodon, his name is. So the creator, his name is. He's a German. His name is. I hope I'm pronouncing it right. Eugene uh, Ruko. He he created um, Mastodon. Uh, he set it out as to be a bit of a social experiment, but a different way for people to engage and socialize. Primarily, he, he thought it that. Uh, with Twitter, his what he was doing with his concept of the social media app, that it shouldn't be owned by one company. That's why it's open source. That's why you can go to GitHub and it can be distributed. And that's why you have uh, all these different servers. And these servers are called instance. And instance is the the platform, if you will, that allows you to tweet. Now, for example, the main instance is the one that was started by um, Eugene. It's called Mastodon.social. And on this instance, and it's still open for anyone to come on, um, it's all these different servers that uh, that people can um, join and participate and sign up for. 
but there are other incidents that might be close. For example, maybe you want to create what are called, you know, the incidents where it's all about, I don't know, uh, basketball. And this instance is particular for fans of the Houston Rockets. And so when people come on, you it might the instance might say Houston dot Rocket. I'm not sure if the Rocket is a um, because it's a website in its essence because you know dot social is a website like dot space or dot um, ninja those type of deal you have to have a domain name for the server uh, for people to go to but uh, for example let's say it's houston.rocket that, that that's possible then you create your your user account you sign up with an email you create a password and you're on houston rocket and the only people that really can completely see your federated timeline are people that are in the the instance of houston rocket unless the server manager says and opens it up and allows for other uh, basketball line minded um, instances to join. Like say, for example, um, the LA Clippers. So there might be a Clippers.social. And so people that are part of the instant rockets, the part of the Clippers rocket can see in the federated timeline, um, other Clippers uh, and Houston rocket fans. And, but you wouldn't be able to be seen on Mastodon social because it's separated. It's, not, it's almost like in its own silo, its own private chat room, if you will. And individually, what you can do with these instances is um, as an individual, you can make your comments um, or your, what are called toots, um, which are up to 500 characters. Um, for your toot, you can make it private, you can make it unlisted where a person who's following you would actually have to go on your timeline to see your toot. Uh, you can um, make it public and going through federated or you can make it to where uh, another feature that some of them are experiencing some instances where it's just in that particular instance it is not shared with any of the other federated, uh, that's what it's called, it's called federated. Uh, timelines, the public timeline, if you will, of everybody's timeline. So while Mastodon is a social media platform, it's kind of like Twitter. It's not global. There's not a global feed, if you will. Everyone um, everyone in the globe would have to be on the same instance for you to get like a global feed. And I think there is some instances that are making alliances in, in green to where their instances are shared or their users instances are shared on other different federated timelines, other different servers, if you will. But there's not going to be like one complete um, sharing, if you will. So you could have like a, a private group that might be about um, decentralized apps or about the Houston Rockets, if you will, that's not really shared with anybody outside of maybe the LA Clippers. And so in order to join or see someone's tweets or suits, I should say, you have to be part of that instance. And there's another privacy measure, if you will, for people. Uh, they don't have to worry about commercialization. Um, while the people who do run the instance, and it is run by a person or a group of people, it is um, they have the servers. And there is a bit of a trust issue, if you will, when it comes to the server that they're not going to take your data and sell it. Um you can donate to the Patreon and the, actually the creator of Eugene um, Rocco, he has a Patreon to help fund his server and the, the actual maintaining the code and the project, if you will. Um, he's not selling anything or anything like that. He's very happy with whatever Patreon donations he gets. Uh, this is just a, a very wonderful experiment for him and something he's very passionate about for him to build the code and make it work. Uh, there has been some updates and upgrades. Um, I'm going to read from this end, end gate um, article. And he's constantly, um, with, because so many people have um, joined Mastodon, and um, we'll talk about it. Um, since I joined back in, uh, when it first popped up, like September, November, I think is when I popped in. Yeah, it's when I popped in around that time when I first saw it. You know, when I say it was a ghost app, it was very slow, very slow to get going. I would pop in and out. I, 
I kind of like to follow projects and see how they develop and, and, and work, basically. I'm a big worker, I always have been. And then as more people start participating, you know, I started to, um, I react, you know, I don't want to say reacted, but I went into my account and uh, started, you know, following along. And it's been very fun. And um, I always personally had an issue with 140 character limit with Twitter. I'm more of a, more of a talker, if you will. I, I like to write a little bit more, be more complete sentences, more clear, if you will. Um, I just can never wrap it around with those short, um, concise points, if you will. Uh, but even with um, the 500 character limit, you can still put like, you know, GIFs and images and video and even audio. I think there's something that's coming up and stuff like that. Mostly GIFs and pictures, but eventually I imagine video feeds and audio might be added to some instances that do that kind of upgrade. Um, but basically, it's a measure. Uh, each instance is run a different way. is a is a measure of response, I would think, to the nature of the way social media um, is run um, and how it's so overtly commercialized that it's um, it's forgetting the per why people went to there in the first place to these social media outlets, the purpose, and not keeping the customer in mind and so focused on. Um, ad revenue to the point to where it, that the changes that are made through some of these social media um, apps are detrimental to its user base, if you will, and to its overall product. But let me get back to Engage um, and about Mr. Eugene Rupel. So there's a hot new social media network. Uh, this is by Nicole, Nicole Wee at Engage these days, and it's called Mastodon. So it was written here in April. And this is when um, Mastodon exploded because Twitter made another change. It just, just kind of upset people. Well, it's not new. It's, seen, it's been around since September 2016, but it's gained tens of thousands of users in the last few days. The reason for this growth? According to the founder, Eugene Rocco, it is, has a lot to do with people getting increasingly fed up with Twitter, especially with the recent decision to nix at usernames from replies. Mastodon, named after the American heavy metal band, is mopping up users seeking an alternative. Sure, Mastodon is still small and readily unheard of, but the very fact that it spurred this much interest is a sign that established social networks like Twitter are fundamentally failing in one thing, keeping users happy. Before we go on, it will help to know what Mastodon is. Some would say it's like a Twitter clone, but there's enough differences that it's really quite a very much like a tweet deck. There's a vertical timeline you can retweet known as a Mastodon as a boost. Uh, favorite star instead of hearts, and boost have a funny nickname. They're toots instead of tweets. But a few features really set it apart. Uh, another thing is that um, it doesn't keep count of any boost or hearts. So it's not a contest, if you will, of trying to engage more with users by boosting your, your uh, posts. It's just something that's constantly, you know, it can be constantly shared and it's not really tracked. That's an important feature. I think. Your limit instead of 140, set content more, and you have more private privacy op options. Posts can be totally public, private only. Your followers can see it, or unlisted, which means it's still viewable to anyone who goes to your profile page, but it won't show up in the public timeline. Differentiator from Twitter is that mass across multiple instances, there's no centralized server, is not really a traditional social network in that sense. Each instance has its own set of users, which I kind of explained earlier, but you can follow and interact with users from, from others. A local timeline only shows posts from your current server, but a federated timeline shows posts from yours, yours as well as the instance of people you follow. There's a more succinct explanation here, so we'll get into that after the rest of this article. Uh, one of the benefits, benefits of having these multiple instances, each can set its own rules. For example, the main instance, Mastodon Social, has a strict policy of no Nazis, no racism, no sexism, no xenophobia, and no discrimination, which can be used as a direct result of Twitter's inability to handle harassment and abuse. The one that I'm on, Mastodon Cloud, just has one rule to follow, which is don't be a jerk can be very well set their own roles entirely up to local admins. Some are very specific, like what the purpose of their instance is. 
example I gave was Houston Rockets, somewhere about, you know, decentralization, cyberpunk stuff, music, they wanted to play instances focused around there. I was a heavy Twitter user since 2000. Twitter kept making bad decisions. He says like changing TweetDeck, closing down a third party app ecosystem, adding ads, and even introducing an algorithm timelines. Twitter was really trying hard not to be Twitter, he said. Instead of the social media companies trying straying too far from what makes them unique, is a problem that seems to be an academic across all the big networks right now. Um, the algorithm timeline, for example, is a feature that Twitter took from Twi from Facebook. Changing up its direct message service to add uh, read receipts and customer service chatbots or other ways Twitter is attempting to match its social network, uh, Facebook. And it's been trying to make users more Twitter-like too. Instead of this being just a tool for friends and family, Facebook has become a place for news, which is a characteristic that used to be Twitter's forte. Combine this with Facebook being more and more like Snapchat with the introduction of stories, and it's easy to see why some people seem to think that all social media are just copycats of each other. Now, Mastodon is not the first one to come along with an alternative to social media melees. There was Elo, Peach, and AppNet, basically a paid version of Twitter, have all pitched themselves as substitutes, and, while, and for a while each of them generated a small amount of buzz, but because they were much too similar to the services that were trying to be thrown, they offered essentially just more of the same. I believe the important part with Mastodon is the ideological shift. Open web federations or slash decentralization free software, says Ruko. Mastodon isn't the first network with ideology. Uh, Dispro promised a similar idea as a Facebook replacement, though it never quite took off due to buggy software, a poor interface, and terrible communication. They still exist, but there's so much there's not much adoption. The question is, can Mastodon do the right thing? Mastodon actually has a pretty, really good code. There's a lot of people that are contributing and helping making instances easier for people to create, whether it be through um, like virtual machines or uh, servers, either servers at home or server services or digital ocean, cloud sources. Um, um, taking the issues or little issues that are quirks are within Mastodon, for example, um, was you weren't capable of deleting your profile, but now you can. Um, when I first logged on to Mastodon, um, it didn't really have a much of a user introduction. Now it does for all the instances. It explains what, what Mastodon is and what it's about and um, what your username is. Um, that was a a big thing because uh, my username on Mastodon Sojo is Hirojashai at Mastodon dot Sojo and there's an at in front of Hiroja as well. Uh, most people that were thinking in the sense of Twitter where you just hit at Hirojashai but that's not true. Um, you have to have the whole line of at Hiroja um, at Mastodon dot Sojo to order to find me. Um, the other big thing is that um, because different instances, if you join them, um, there could be a John Smith um, on a different uh, instance. Um, there's not any kind of like verification as far as username. So someone could be posing as you if you have a very unique or uh, identifiable um social profile if you will so there's not that quite of a check unless you actually talk to the admin if that person is actually making um an account based off of you maybe you can address that with that individual admin uh depends on the rules of those particular instances and stuff like that but there's not any direct response at the moment uh while there's a few issues for one there could be a duplicate username in different instances so if you're john smith on master on social for example there very well could be a completely different John Smith on Mastodon Cloud, which is a problem if you don't want people impersonating you. Also, I mentioned before, Mastodon doesn't work the same way as other social networks. Your posts can't be seen on a global feed, only ones that users are federated with. And yes, for now, you can't easily delete a Mastodon account after you create it, which is a big deal for those who value data privacy. Yet, for the past few days, Mastodon has been on an upward trajectory. There are are already hundreds of different instances and several have tens of thousands of users 
Ruku even had to shut down the main Mastodoc social instance to alleviate the server stress and to encourage users to get on the instances distributed load. And of course, the numbers don't really compare to millions of users on Twitter and Facebook. With all its complexity, it's unlikely Mastodon will become a new social media giant. For it, but it really doesn't need to be. Ruka has no desire to make money from the endeavor. He's happy with the modest uh, 2100 he's getting a month from Patreon, which is enough to pay for, for his living expenses. There's no telling how long the funds will continue, but since Mastodon is open source, it could very well live on with or without Ruka at the helm. Even Mastodon doesn't make it to the big leagues. However, it still sends an important message that the big networks need to stop copying each other and start listening to users instead of doing what the investors and advertisers want. Perhaps Twitter and Facebook should do what their communities want. Uh, the time is simply right, says Ruko. Uh, people haven't been happy with commercial platforms for a while, especially Twitter, but until now they didn't see any viable alternative. But now they finally think that there is one. And I think because Mastodon is so, it, it's actually coded very, very well. It had uh, the concept of making itself user friendly from the get go. That um, that is that is adoption is um, is possible, and more importantly, um, the fact that it's open source, so people can examine the code, they can fork it if they want to, they can create their own entire different concept of Mastodon if they want. Um, and because of these different instances that they're um, kind of their own, like almost separate kind of chat silos that they're people are referring to it, um, it allows for people to have a bit more control, um, especially if they want to talk about specific subjects or concerned about their data information being out there. Uh, right now, there's a lot of, I would say, very tech savvy people on there. Um, there's a lot of LGBTQ people out there. There's a lot of people that are using this this platform to uh, communicate with already already known community members and engaging with other people. But most importantly, being able to um, you can say um, being able to have a say how their information is distributed. I think it's important in this very digital age to be able to have that some that type of control, um, which you don't necessarily so much with Facebook and Twitter too much. It's either you just don't use it, and then therefore you're not engaged, um, which I don't think is a really good um, defense. Like that's what people say. Well, then don't use it. It's it's kind of hard not to use it. That's where people are out. People are on social media apps, and if you want to communicate with somebody, if you want to to talk or engage in the world around you, you you have to participate. And but being able to have some say or how you participate in the world, and have a bit more control and where it's less commercialized, and you're not um, everything's not monetized or something like that to a point um, towards you're getting hit up with ads all the time. Um, your data being mined and sold or um, harassment, if you will, um, is important. Uh, so this is from Hacker Noon. This is actually from the Mastodon creator. He published this March 31st. Uh, Eugene Ruka, developer of Mastodon, a, a FOSS decentralized micro blogging platform. Welcome to Mastodon. What's the difference and why it's better? My name is Eugene Ruko, and I'm the creator of Mastodon, a free, open-source, federated social network. The flagship instance, Mastodon Social, has over 24,000 users and is growing fast. You can check it here. You have arrived at the, at the place as users in Deer call Fluffy Elephant Side. The default user interface reminds you of TweetDeck. You notice that you can write short notices. It seems familiar, but what's different? One of Mastodon's fundamental differences to Twitter is federation. To bring that word in context, context, the United States of America are a federation. In a more technical context, email is a federation. It means that users are spread throughout different independent communities that remain unified in their ability to interact with each other. You can send an email from Gmail to Outlook, from Outlook to someone's private email inbox, 
and, Meta- and Madison's Mastodon's Federation similar. Users from different sites, let's call them instances, establish connections between these sites by following each other and sending each other messages like any other social network. You have likely come across the instance Mastodon Social, which I run. It's not all Mastodon, but just one point of entry into the network. One potential home. Your username is unique on the particular instance. That means you're fully identifier. You're just like an email address. You must include the username part and the domain part. For example, I'm Gregon at Mastodon.social. And my friend who runs Ashadorn website, another instance is Kayla C at Ashadorn website. Of course, if you wish to find a, or mention a user from the same instance as your, yours, you can omit the domain part is implicit. What federation means for you is that you have the username you desire as long as you can find an instance where it's available. You can pick an instance run by someone you trust and whose content policies you agree with or run your one yourself with some technical knowledge. Users can spread out so individual instances are smaller and such communities are easier to build and moderate. No monopolies. If one instance ever shuts down, you don't have to convince your friends to switch to a different social network. You just let them know to follow your new account on a different instance. Another fundamental difference is that unlike Twitter, Mastodon is free open source software. You might think that's unimportant, but I think the difference between ethical design oriented towards users and design oriented towards revenue are becoming more apparent. The free, quote unquote, and free quote unquote software stands for freedom of the users, not for the value of the money it costs, which only coincidentally is zero in most cases. Mastodon isn't built for selling your eyeballs or analytics to advertisers. Allowing anyone to expect to code and submit improvements means that it's built for people by people and the scrutiny of people. Mastodon's 500 character limit allows for more nuanced conversations and less tweet storming. Uh, Mastodon features public timelines, something Twitter used to have, but it stopped being useful to everyday users and became, became useful to data mining companies. Ever since individual Mastodon instances are small, repeated posts and conversations are filtered out, public timelines stay readable. Of course, having a readily available public timeline can be a curse as much as a blessing, so you can opt out of hearing it. In terms of privacy dealing with abuse, Mastodon's got a lot of gradual, gradual privacy features that I've described in depth in another article, and we'll, we'll talk about that. Uh, not wanting to go into precise details, I believe that it should be succinct, primer on the Mastodon strengths. There are lots of smaller goodies that you will discover over time. If you'd like to get started someplace other than Mastodon Social run by me, here are two instances run by people I trust. And he has a link in the, in the documentation. Enjoy your stay. Uh, the source code, documentation, more technical FAQs, lists of instances, and available apps are still available through the project GitHub repository. So let's talk about the apps. Um, Android, there, there's a bit of the issues. Not all of them have been approved. I do have an iPhone, and the app for uh, Mastodon is called um, Amarcore. And it's very easy to use. It's very similar to your usage on um, the desktop, if you will. The, um, It has the local federated notifications and more. Um, It's very clean. Uh, Mastodon itself, like its colors and stuff, is kind of very um, black and green, kind of very um, basic. Um, But I guess you can, I guess within time, they'll be able to allow for maybe a little bit more color, if you will. I personally like it. Um, I'm not following too many people. Um, I made a few different posts. I do like to, um, when I find someone interesting, I like to follow them and boost them when I can, um, engage when I think it's appropriate, um, or I have something to say. Um, in general, my Mastodon experience has been pretty simple. Um, it's still very um, new. Uh, there's still little quirks. Um, for example, um, in the federated timeline, um, because people can join from different you know, global areas, um, there isn't a language filter, which I find very 
fascinating because on Twitter you do have that where you know you basically get English if you're an English speaker you see English tweets. Um, occasionally you might see another language tweet um, within your Twitter line, but for the most part they're kind of uh, segregated by region, I guess you can say. So you see stuff in um, Chinese, Japanese, French, German, um, and I, I like that even though I personally can't read or know I might be able to Google translate some of them but in general I like the fact that um, it's global in that sense that you know it's not uh, segregated because people um, speak different languages um, sometimes even when they're in different languages like if they have a gif or a picture in it and I find it amusing I you know I star it or I boost it, if you will. So it's just, in general, it's just very um, overall fascinating. Um, as more instances are developed and as more people examine the code and look at it, I I can personally see this um, gaining some traction. I don't think it will unseat Twitter or any social media app, but I think it might be a place to where... Um, they will be a place to where which um, certain segments of people will go to where there'll be uh, more nuanced dialogue. And then from there, it might um, jump out into other social media sites. There are linkages where you can link them, your Mastodon posts into Twitter and stuff like that. But um, I think it might be a launching point for other discussions, almost in the essence like where the um, blogging platform Medium has becoming a launching point for discussions in various um, dialogues and news stories. I think that um, that's what something that Mastodon in and of itself um, may become. So this is another post um, by Regine Yuka, uh, Learning from Twitter's Mistakes. This is actually on um, Medium. Uh, privacy abuse and handling tools in Mastodon. So uh, very early on the development of Mastodon, I decided that centralized and unexpected algorithm changes were not the only one of Twitter's problems. Harassments and tools to deal with it have always been lacking on Twitter's end. And I reach out to people who have been affected by it to collect ideas. And here's what I gather. When you block someone, you don't want to see them ever. That means that if someone you follow shares their post, you don't want to see it. If someone talks about them, you don't want to see it. If someone replies to their posts and mentions you, you don't want to see it. And that's how it should be and that's how it works in Mastodon. Yeah, that's very important because, for example, there are certain um, news sites or news stories or certain very popular people um, that I don't want to see from that um, I blocked, but because someone I follow might repost or at them, I see that and that's something that, um, yeah, it's a problem. Of course, maybe you don't want to go that far. Maybe you don't want to see someone's post, not lock them off entirely. Muting the account to remove it from your feed is also possible. You can hide an individual post text behind a content warning, whether to use this for trigger warnings or spoiler warnings is, the, uh, is up to you. Beyond this, when you share images that you, want, you wouldn't want someone to see, you looking at in public can you mark individual posts as containing sensitive material sometimes you want to broadcast to the open web other times you want to address only people that you know for this purpose you can optionally lock your account requiring all new followers to get approved before being allowed to follow you independently of this you can individually choose the visibility of your posts public or visible only to followers and the people you've mentioned in them the presence of the public timelines are timelines of everyone's posts Mandates a middle ground where your posts are still fully public but opted out of being listed on public timelines. When you encounter inappropriate content, there's a quick option to report the account, allowing you to select any of any post and optionally specify a message. In some cases, you know exactly who you want to talk to and you you don't, and who you don't. You have a choice choice to outright block any notifications from people you don't follow to never see a rando again, or you or who you don't follow, limiting yourself to mutuals. Uh, the federated, na federated nature of the network also implicit on behavior. Different instances owned 
um, by different entities will have different rules and moderation policies that gives the power to shape smaller, independent, yet integrated communities back to the people. As an end user, you have the ability to choose an instance with rules and policies that you agree with, or you roll your own if you're technically inclined. Uh, smaller, tight-knit communities are less prone to harboring toxic behavior. You can think of it as a moderation work of an entire network being spread somewhat between countless administrators of independent but comp compatible communities, which makes it more scalable than a single multi-millionaire, multi-millionaire, single multi-million user company with a small safety team. Uh, this is, uh, I need to specify that nationally moderation is not a global in the network. An admin of one instance cannot affect the account of a user on another. Admins have control over the content that arrives on their instance and can curate with various tools. This allows places with different rules to coexist. So, for example, maybe there might be an instance that's for um, bad jokes, if you will, or um, not safe for work joke. And so, it might be th those type of jokes can might be considered very tasteless for some people. And so you can't, you know, report somebody or the admin for a tasteless joke because on that instance it's accepted. But what you could do is just mute and block and you won't be able to see um, that person's tasteless jokes ever. Of course, communities with sole purpose of spreading toxic behavior will pop up too. In such cases, the instant administrator can blacklist specific instances outright. It can take substantially more effort to set a brand new instance than it is to create a new account on a centralized Network, you can have to require hosting, domain name, and best time installation and configuration. So blacklist evading is a lot harder. So that's, that is a thing um, I think is very key and important because you could have an instance that might be welcome Nazis or something like that. And other instances will blacklist that instance so that no one from that you know welcome Nazi feed is federated into their, their servers. And so the, these type of troll activities are not going to get um, what they want. And even if they were to go undercover, if you will, or create fake uh, profile type account names, uh, they can easily be blocked by the admin. And maybe there might be, eventually, if it becomes an issue, maybe there might be some kind of shared admin policy to, you know, hey, this is a consistent troll from da-da-da IP address or something like that. But as far as creating toxic communities for the purpose of being toxic or a community that might be just not what people want, want to see, being able to be blacklisted and not shared amongst uh, as many instances might not create a community that people might want to stay in. Because it's hard to troll people if you are a troll yourself. You know, trolling trolls is not as fun for trolls, I guess you can say. With all this, Massa aims to be safer and more humane place. So this is the last article, and then I'll talk a little bit about my more about my Mastodon experience, and then it closes out this review. Um, how the blockchain may solve a key issue with Mastodon, the new federated Twitter alternative. This is from Crypto Insider, posted by... Cal Torbury. Uh, this came out April 21st. So Mastodon and uh, we already know what Mastodon. Um, so it had it's uh, has attracted some notable members of the Bitcoin community. While far from perfect, the federated ad-free structure of Mastodon is attractive to those who are less interested in peer-to-peer -peer digital cash systems like Bitcoin. As it turns out, the Bitcoin blockchain may also be useful for solving one of the key issues with Mastodon architecture, which is based around a federated instance. What are the difference between Mastodon and Twitter? Um, some problems with Mastodon, so just jump me down here. Of course, Mastodon federated type model is not perfect. As some have pointed out, one of the issues with the platform right now is that users need to be somewhat trustful of their instant administrators, which is true, and we talked about that a little bit earlier in the episode. The admins have the ability to delete content and accounts on the local server, and it's also possible that the entire federated federation of instances will eventually centralize, centralize around a few key servers that make the system look more similar to how Twitter works today. One of the key issues when it comes to trusting an instant administrator is how to do with the potential of that individual or entity acting in a way that makes users want to migrate to another instance. 
While it's possible to back up one's own user data and import it to, into a new instance, all of one's followers will need to be notified about the move too. They won't follow the new account by default. This adds some friction for the idea that an instant administrator can, cannot wield any power over their users. How the blockchain can help. The specific scenario where a user wants to move to another instance without losing all their followers is where blockchains, Bitcoin's blockchain may be helpful. Keybase and OneName are identity service that allow users to map up all their online accounts to a single identity. All this data is hashed into the Bitcoin blockchain to prevent tampering from anyone but the real world owner of the digital identity. When Bob follows Alice on Mastodon, it would be possible to follow at Alice's Keybase or OneName account rather than her current Mastodon address. That means that Bob will be following whatever account Alice's Keybase or OneName account is mapped to rather than a specific static static Mastodon address. With this setup, Bob can automatically follow Alice's new Mastodon address if she decides to switch to a new Mastodon instance for whatever reason, as long as she updates her one name or key, key base account. By mapping Mastodon addresses to blockchain-based identities, a bit more power can be removed from the instance administrators. Integration with key base or one name may also remove some of the confusion users have with Mastodon addresses in the first place. Of course, it's still unclear how necessary the use of blockchain will turn out to be in these sort of digital identity systems. It's possible that trusted third parties such as Electronic Frontier Foundation can provide this sort of service for free on a centralized server. This was also early uh, Bitcoin developer Martin Mellons identified which stores public data on the IPFS network. So that's that's one issue when it comes to you know identity and stuff like that and the, the trust of admins. Um, also, just uh, breaking up the, the type of servers, the using of, um, I don't know, maybe storage or these different types of um, DAO creation or Ethereum-based blockchain creations that are, or even decentralized um, creations are coming up that are trying to make things less serverless. There might be an option for the Mastodon code to adapt to, to where things are more distributed when it comes to... Um, computing power, if you will. So overall, I've liked my experience with Mastodon. I like that now that more people are involved, there, there's more instances, which I have a link in the show notes, as well as the link to the GitHub, and um, as well as my username to different, um, the two different Mastodon accounts, um, one on social Mastodon and one at Awu Space. Uh, I think in general that this is just very new. It's only a few months old. Um, I might revisit um, the subject and review of Mastodon a, a year from now. Um, you know, it has its quirks. It has its issues. You know, you're still trusting a third party with your information, and there's no guarantee that your stuff won't be sold. How people... Um, administrate their instances might be a bit of a dilemma if people have like power trips or something like that you know you're still dealing with you know humans human interaction but overall i think this experience might have a positive impact and it'll be interesting to see um as time goes on what develops with mastodon in and of itself so Overall, I, I would recommend for you to try out Mastodon. Maybe it's something that you're interested in. If you're technically uh, savvy, maybe you want to build an instance and you might create your own uh, Houston.Rocket uh, instance where you can talk about basketball or the Kansas City Chiefs or maybe soccer. Or maybe you want to create your own you know, Dogecoin or Bitcoin space. Or maybe you're interested in something very obscure like I don't know um, archaeology or something of that nature um, but it's a way of just another way of people gathering in a much maybe much smaller space instead of um, getting swallowed up if you will in the Jonas will that is um, some of these behemoth um, these um, existing social media services so um I'm graded as usability at a, a B, 
I think the username thing is a big issue and the uh, uh, keeping the name, making sure it's not across all different instances, if you will, is an issue. Um, I think creating an instance, um, while there's been a couple different user um, generated how to do so, I think it would be much um easier if there was a much clearer like kind of a one two three almost like construction paper style um breakdown like you know like a you, like a kindergarten school if you will like a to b to c to d on how to do it for so that any user could be able to deploy an instance for themselves um but I would give it an A for its promise. It's promise for the fact that it's a well thought out concept and that it's coded very well in general, even with these kind of quirks, if you will. I th even with its um, issues with the administrative instance and the, um, the development of instance and users' names, and the creator sees these issues and things of that nature and sees it not only as an asset but also as a way to even this bit of his flaws as a way to kind of engage people and maybe develop and create something better um he seems to be very responsive to that oh and i also have a link to his patreon account if you wish to contribute to his patreon so overall i would recommend usage of mastodon so that's it for my review um, and my thoughts on the whole matter. Um, thank you very much for listening. And until another time, um, I'll see you around. Perhaps on Mastodon. Thank you for listening. Please rate and review either through iTunes or Stitchers or any of the podcasting apps that you're currently using to listen to this show. Thank you and until next time. This has been a Herosha Shine Space Odyssey Network production.